hopefully others will join us uh, as we go along. Um, so welcome and thank you all very much, not just for coming today, but more importantly, for your commitment to working with us to tackle the climate emergency here in Oxford. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Councillor Susan Brown. I'm leader of Oxford City Council and I'll be chairing today's summit and hopefully getting us through it um, with everyone having a chance to have their say and, uh, uh, and for us all to hear from you all. Um, I do need to make you sure that you all understand, as, uh, as I have just been reminded, that we will be recording this meeting. Um, and that's just so that we can use some extracts from it for promotional purposes. But please rest assured that we wouldn't be doing that with unless we have your full agreement for, for each clip. So um, I hope that um, no one's got any objection to that. I'll pause in case anyone does but I'm not seeing anything. So good, um, I'm hoping that's fine with people then. Um, we have got a lot of speakers uh, to hear from today because I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to contribute so we can hear about the work that you're doing and start the useful partnership working that we all need to achieve our aims. Uh, so with that in mind, please do stick to the timings on the agenda and don't run over um, if you can possibly avoid it so that we get to hear from everyone. Um, we'll be starting with our two keynote speakers, uh, the first of which is Councillor Tom Hayes, the Cabinet Member uh, for Zero Carbon Oxford at the City Council, uh, and then Professor Nick Eyre, Professor of Energy and Climate Policy at the Environmental Change Institute, and uh, most recently also Scientific Advisor to Oxford City Council. And then we'll move on to hear from the rest of you. Uh, so everyone has an opportunity, but don't feel you have to use it if you don't want to at this particular stage. Um, and then just to remind you on the agenda, we'll then hear from Rose Dickinson, the Carbon Reduction Manager on our Roadmap to Zero Carbon. Um, and then finally, we will move on to signing of the Charter, which we'll do by a show of hands. Uh, so one final bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Tom, which is please do feel free to use the chat function and that's going to be monitored by our officers, Tom, Ruth and Rose. So thank you all very much for coming. Uh, look forward to hearing from you all uh, during the course of the meeting. And Tom, over to you. Thanks, Susan. And thank you all for coming today and your commitment. Uh, we meet in a time of pandemic each of us is striving to meet the challenges created by coronavirus. The NHS is saving life here in Oxford. Our city's knowledge is lighting the candle at the end of a very long tunnel to guide us out of our isolation. And we want to thank the organisations who are here today for their incredible responses to the pandemic. Each of us in our, in our lives is doing what the science tells us we must do to protect life. We overcome setback, we push through doubt, because really what matters at the end of the day is the protection of life, our own lives, and the lives of those we love. We meet in this time of pandemic because another global crisis that emphasizes our interconnectedness and our shared fate, the climate crisis is not going away and it demands our urgent action. We meet so that each of us in our organizations can do what the science tells us we must do to protect life, moving at all necessary speed with the necessary intensity of effort. The City Council wants our new partnership to lead the city by following the science. The science substantially developed by Oxford scientists is clear. We must reduce our carbon emissions to end our contribution to the climate crisis, and we must adapt to our changing climate. So thank you for joining together today. Words like pandemic and crisis can terrify. Our brains are wired to escape fear and to find others, our own community, when something feels enormous, overwhelming. We want to stand together with others. We wise to search for the action that offers hope, and today we'll hear many reasons to feel hope in our city. Increasingly, we're also seeing that hope in the countries from across the world, making pledges of increased ambition towards tackling climate change. We can more sharply and clearly see the sense of justice that we owe to countries struggling to withstand the impacts of climate change right now, impacts that they could not create themselves because they are too poor and too disadvantaged. And closer to home, we're seeing the push to decarbonize rising up the agenda. In line with the law of the land, Oxford will become a zero carbon city by 2050. But we all here today have the opportunity to go further and faster than the national legal targets. In stating our shared ambition at this summit, we all have the chance to play our part in our national effort. And in so doing, to bolster this country's climate diplomacy and help the UK to set a hopeful example to 
to all the countries in the world that need to raise their ambition at the critical UN Climate Summit to be held in Glasgow later this year. We've convened the Zero Carbon Summit to bring together the city's leading organisations behind the joint ambition to be a net zero city by 2040. This is one whole decade sooner than the national legal target of 2050. Why? Why are we proposing this? Because our world rests on democracy and science, and so must our response together. The imperative to go faster is democratic, led by our public in Oxford. The specifics of going faster are science-based. With the first citizens' assembly on climate change uh, to be held by a UK city, held here in Oxford a year ago, and the pandemic understandably being most people's focus since then, the City Council conducted a survey through our deliberately representative residence panel last month, and the results were striking. 90% of our citizens in that panel remain concerned about climate change. Later, I'll outline in more detail the work of the City Council to meet the democratic imperative. Now I'll talk about the science-based approach. If the basis of scientific inquiry is asking questions, the result of scientific inquiry is reaching answers. And to help the City Council reach answers, we created a unique role in local government to provide expert advice on the science around climate change. The City Council has appointed Professor Nick Eyre, who you'll hear from today, as our scientific advisor. This adoption of a science-based approach is deliberate. The Council has resisted calls to pluck targets out of thin air. We recognise that our trust in democracy would not have been strengthened if councillors had set impossible targets that we might have been around to miss. We're taking all necessary time to get this right and to build everybody's confidence in our process. Now, Oxford's business as usual has never been other people's business as usual. The council and our close partners, represented by many of you in this room, have translated enormous ambition into deep decarbonisation before. Our proposed zero carbon Oxford partnership will build on the work of one such ambition, the low carbon Oxford partnership, launched in 2010 with the aim of reducing carbon emissions by 40% by 2020 on 2005 levels here in Oxford. The city has achieved this target and that achievement is down substantially to you. We want to build a partnership that showcases all of our successes and builds for even more, not to wag fingers or apportion blame. The council doesn't have all the answers, but together this partnership absolutely does. Finally, our summit will showcase your climate plans, your climate action. We hope to establish at the end of it a partnership that will be strategically important to achieving a net zero city by 2040, a better city that we're even more proud to live in and work in. So I'm excited for this summit. I'm excited to see what emerges from it. I think it's going to be brilliant. Today is going to be a very hopeful day. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you for spending time with each other. And thank you for coming and your contributions. Thank you. And thank you for keeping us well in, in, under, into time. So thanks very much, Tom. Um, Nick, I think it's over to you now. So Professor Nick Eyre. Thanks Susan and thanks Tom. And I'm going to talk uh, about the, uh, the, the, the reasoning for Oxford's targets for, uh, uh, as Tom has, has set out. Just going to try and share my screen. Uh, is that working for people? Yep. Great. Yeah, that's good. Um, so why should Oxford have a more ambitious target from a, a, a scientific point of view? What's the concept? What's the context? Uh, this chart here uh, put together uh, by myself and the, and the City Council officers shows how uh, Oxford's uh, target, the, the green line, Oxford's proposed target of 2040 compares uh, with the national targets set out in the uh, uh, it, it, by, by the Committee of Cli on Climate Change and adopted by the government. Uh, so the, the differences are, are fairly clear. Uh, Oxford's proposed target compared to the national target has greater early ac action, then follows a similar shape in the period from 2025 to 2040, but uh, quite sharp reductions uh, with a less gradual end uh, and reaches net zero 10 years earlier than the government's uh, target, as, as Tom has already set out. One important distinction, of course, is that the national targets are legally binding on government. They are enforced through the Climate Change Act, whereas Oxford's targets would, of course, be uh, uh, targets would be policy aspirations. So worth bearing that in mind. What's the scientific basis for having a different uh, approach in Oxford? Um, 
essentially, uh, we need to ask where Oxford needs to make progress and whether that's easier or more easy or more difficult and what needs to be done nationally. Uh, the diagram here is taken from some work by Antithesis for the City Council and shows where uh, the emissions in, in Oxford come from. They are overwhelmingly from buildings and road transport, homes, institutional commercial buildings, industrial buildings, road transport are, dominate the City Council's emissions and that's quite a different picture uh, from, from the national picture um, and points towards different targets. If you look at how difficult decarbonisation is in different sectors, uh, the, 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 the diagram here on the right is taken from the uh, most recent report of the Committee on Climate Change uh, and uh, shows uh, the, uh, the, the, the different rates of decarbonisation expected across the UK in different sectors. It's pretty complex, but just to pull out the key points, sectors in which decarbonisation is relatively difficult and projected to be slow are aviation, heavy road freight, uh, industrial processes and agriculture. And those, fortunately you might think for Oxford, are the sectors which aren't very heavily represented in, in Oxford's emissions. Sectors in which progress is easier, probably less difficult would be a, a wiser phrase, uh, are electricity supply, surface transport buildings, uh, and as we've already heard, transport and buildings uh, often, and, and, uh, often supplied by electricity uh, are the, air, are the, uh, the sectors in, in, from which uh, emissions from Oxford are dominant. So Oxford's emissions are uh, strongly weighted to the, the sectors which are less difficult to decarbonise. Uh, that justifies earlier action and the faster descent to an earlier zero than in the national targets. And as Tom's already em emphasised, Oxford is centre of innovation, and uh, I think many of us will want to think about how we should include that emphasis in, 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 in Oxford's targets and what Oxford does. So my conclusions are that Oxford can decarbonise more easily than the UK uh, as a whole, uh, and therefore an earlier uh, net zero target date than 2050 is appropriate on a, from a scientific point of view. Uh, we should bear in mind that decarbonising Oxford will rely on progress elsewhere, especially for the decarbonisation of electricity and potential availability of hydrogen, which will largely have to come from outside the city. And there are, therefore our focus in the city needs to be on reducing demand, the things we all know about, uh, insulation, uh, encouraging cycling and walking, public transport, but increasingly also electrification of heating systems and vehicles. I think the exact targets are a matter for po political priority uh, and judgment. Uh, my advice to the City Council has been that 2040 is an ambitious target, but it's technically feasible. It will require Oxford to move more quickly than the national average on those areas of reducing energy use in buildings uh, and, and transport, so we should be clear about that. I think there are also it's, there are long term uncertainties at a city level, uh, given our dependence on, on energy from outside the city, and therefore uh, it would be sensible to have periodic reviews of the later targets. I'll leave it there, Susan. And well, thank, thank you. Share my screen. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Nick. It's really helpful to have that sort of scientific um, basis uh, as, as an introduction. Um, I'm hoping that we can now start moving along um, to take contributions from, from the floor, as it were, from the virtual floor. Um, I, I, I'm asking people if at all possible to keep their remarks to three minutes. Um, I know some people have got slides and, and some people don't, um, and, and it may be that not everyone wants to speak, but um, hopefully everyone's got an opportunity for their organisation to have a chance to contribute. Um, so I, I, there is an order which is set out in the agenda, which um, is relatively random, um, but I will use that and, and just indicate um, if, if you don't want to speak um, on that order, please. So um, I think that takes us on to our first speaker, um, and that's Professor Louise Richardson, Vice Chancellor of the University of Oxford, um, who have been doing a lot of work in this area. So Louise, over to you.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here and to give my strong support on behalf of my colleagues across the university to the Zero Carbon Oxford Charter. We announced back in October 2019 that the university would put in place a sustainability strategy. Since then, we have consulted widely with over 2,000 responses from within the university. And the final draft strategy is going to be put to the University Council next month. It is certainly our belief that uh, this is simply a, an idea whose time has come and that if we've learned nothing else from the pandemic, we've learned the terrible costs we pay when we ignore um, the consequences of events, high consequence events heading our way. So our strategy has two goals, net biodiversity gain by 2035 and net zero carbon by 2035. Now, unlike everybody, uh, it's very easy to get people to agree to targets, much more difficult to get people to agree to the policies that will realize those targets. So we're going to ensure that we realize them by affecting governance changes in our regulations to establish a new university sustainability subcommittee, annual reporting on sustainability alongside our financial reporting, agreement in principle that we will pay for offsetting to achieve our 2035 goals, and a new sustainability fund that will deliver well over 100 million pounds of investment in sustainability between now and 2035. Looking beyond the university, I'd just like to say on behalf of my colleagues that we applaud the efforts of the city and county council to reduce traffic and improve public transport, walking and cycling. We support the proposed new workplace parking levy. We support the new zero emission zone. We continue to invest in walking and cycling and already have a university workplace parking levy the proceeds of which are spent on the environment. We support the Osney, Evesham and Warrenford Meadow cycleways. We support the city's new environmental standards for new buildings and indeed have put an extra 12 million pounds into our new life and mind building to meet these standards. And we support the city's efforts to attract funding for better rail facilities in Oxford. And finally, of course, we are a university and our biggest contribution is often that of the research done by our academics. And as you know, our academics are responsible for leading research on many aspects of sustainability. Many serve on the national and international biodiversity and climate change panels. And indeed, the very first grant for the newly established um, Strategic Research Fund was a 2.2 million grant to uh, Professors Miles Allen and Cameron Hepburn for Oxford Net Zero. So um, I hope you all find this a, a productive session and we're delighted to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louisa, and, and big thanks for the work that the university is doing in this area. And um, I completely agree that the support of uh, academically and in terms of research and innovation is going to be really key for all of us. So thank you. Um, the next on my list is Councillor Yvonne Constance, who is the Cabinet Member for Environment at Oxfordshire County Council. Um, so Yvonne, over to you. Um, I believe you've got some slides. Well, unmute as well. I'm even unmuted. Right, we are here. Uh, thank you for um, thank you for the invitation to join this partnership. Um, Oxford City knows, of course, that uh, the county are very active supporters of um, the low carbon Oxford, and we work in partnership with them. Are my slides there? I understood that they would be um, that they would come up. We're not going to waste time. Um, we, um, we are, of course, working in partnership with Oxford City on, um, well, all the transport schemes that have just been outlined by the professor. Thank you, University, for your support for those. Um, Oxford County has uh, rather got ahead of all of you because we have actually committed to being carbon neutral in our own estate by 2030. We will do that by better design, property sharing, energy efficiency, switch to electric vehicles. The um, county fleet is switching as, as soon as the, um, the current hiring contracts come, come due for renewal. And we are supporting um, the um, um, low energy Oxfordshire generation scheme. We will drive for zero carbon in Oxfordshire, that is for the whole county by 2050. And if we can make it earlier, we will do. Our local transport and connectivity plan will come out for its first consultation on the vision that we have to reduce all car transport, encourage people into public transport and active walking and cycling. 
reducing the impact of waste. We are already the, um, the, the nation's leaders in, um, in proportion of waste recycled. So we aim to move from roughly 60% to 70% by 2025. We're supporting communities to act. We support um, 65, 70 community action groups in, um, in renewable schemes and environmental schemes. We play our role in delivering low carbon development and we support natural carbon management. We work with our suppliers. We have reviewed our procurement and our supply chain, and we will play our role in supporting retrofit, including um, encouraging our highways maintenance contractors to all renewable um, um, recyclable systems that they can. Tar will no longer be dumped. It will be reused so far as is possible. So we, in this partnership, we will share and learn from best practice. We will build on existing partnerships to develop and deliver our transport vision for Oxford. And the local, the, the, the new transport strategy consultation is a major part of that. And we will provide a conduit, a, con, a channel for issues that span the city boundaries. It's a very important part of my work always to extend what we learn in and around the city to ensure that the rest of the county benefits as well. So I thank you for this opportunity and look forward to hearing all the ways in which um, your partners will be accelerating their move to net zero. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I'm really sorry about the slides. I think we're having some technical difficulties behind the scenes uh, in terms of uh, had, someone who's got the slides. I had plenty <laughs> difficulty getting here at all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, and um, I, over to you now, Joel. Um, uh, so Joel McGundy is here as the Group Environmental Manager from Unipart. So Joel, I think you also have some slides. I don't know if you're able to share them yourself. Oh, sorry. Yes, I have. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel, um, as you. Susan said, uh, from uh, Unipart Group. So I'll just try to share my slides here, if I may. of silence as I try to do this, apologies. Okay, uh, almost there. So just by way of introduction, uh, Unipad Group uh, is headquartered in Oxford, obviously, and uh, we span manufacturing, logistics, and consulting sectors. Um, and we've got a presence globally, and so we operate across uh, all continents, but uh, mainly in, in the UK. So how is Unipart uh, trying to meet the climate challenge? Um, we've got a strategy which is aligned with the UN Sustainability Development Goals, which I think uh, most, if not all of you, are aware of. And... Uh, we have uh, basically committed to becoming carbon neutral by year 2030, just like uh, Oxford County Council. Um, we've been supported uh, uh, on this path by uh, an external partner, and we've actually have uh, embedded science-based targets in our carbon plan. This is uh, the current climate science. This is what the current uh, climate science uh, says. Um, so the, the plan basically covers scopes one and two, which is uh, direct and indirect emissions from uh, use of uh, gas and fossil fuels and purchased electricity. We got plans to extend this to scope three uh, uh, later this year. So scope three is uh, our supply chain emissions and other indirect emissions. Uh, there is just uh, uh, an illustration of uh, and definition of scopes uh, one, two, and three. Uh, we are for now focusing on uh, the red and the green sections, scopes one and two, uh, on purchased electricity and uh, gas and fuel for our fleet. So uh, what are the key stages that we followed uh, in establishing our science-based targets? So first of all, stage one, we had to measure and verif verify our carbon footprint. That's our own emissions. Um, and then we had it verified to ISO 14064. Uh, stage two was to actually set the science-based targets and align um, our actions to climate science and the 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. And lastly, we 
completed stage three, which was uh, about implementation plan to achieve and support the science-based targets of our own operations. Uh, we carried out a gap analysis of uh, what we previously identified uh, as opportunities and what we need to do to bridge the gap between uh, now and 2030 to achieve uh, our carbon neutral status. Um, we've also mapped out the projects and technology that we need to implement to be able to meet uh, the carbon neutral target by 2030. Um, we've got retrofits and energy efficiency projects like uh, LED lighting, uh, behavioral changes and things like that. We also intend to introduce technological design changes and uh, change the way we procure our energy. So moving to renewable electricity and later on to green gas, which is not that easy as of now. And it's actually expensive. Um, we are also doing some work on our fleet improvements. We've got uh, a fleet of over 300 uh, trucks and vans. So there is quite a lot of work that we need to do on that front. Uh, in terms of uh, the measuring and uh, carbon footprinting exercise that we, we did last year, um, it showed that we've got a greatest proportion of our emissions coming from our distribution sites, uh, followed by uh, fleet HGVs, and then natural gas and so forth, as you can see in the chart there. So the work that we did last year, uh, gave us uh, this uh, trajectory uh, from 2019 to 2044. Uh, that's how we have to proceed to be able to be carbon neutral by 2030 and to be net zero by 2044. But we are hoping to align it to the zero carbon Oxford target of uh, 2040. So hopefully we should be able to do all that uh, in due course. So that's, uh, that, that's uh, Unipart, and uh, thank you very much. And we are actually excited to be part of the Zero Carbon Oxford. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And um, I think we're now over to Andy Mazzuccelli. I hope I pronounced that wrong. I fear I haven't. Um, who's the Energy and Sustainability Manager at Landsec. So, Andy, over to you. Thanks, Susan. Um, good morning, everyone. Really great to be here. I'm obviously really delighted to be part of this partnership. So my name is Andy Matsukele. I am the Energy and Sustainability Manager at Landsec. Um, I lead on driving down energy usage and carbon emissions across our operations to deliver our net zero carbon strategy. Landsec is one of the UK's largest commercial property development and investment companies who own and manage uh, over 24, square, uh, 24 million square foot of property of office specialists and retail buildings, including uh, the Oxford Westgate Shopping Centre. We take sustainability uh, very seriously. Landsec was, in fact, the first commercial real estate company in the world to commit to science-based reduction targets for CO2, aligning with a one and a half degree warming scenario. And we've pledged to become a, a net zero carbon business by 2030. So really to play our part in reducing global emissions, over the past decade, um, we've developed and embedded our net zero carbon strategy, delivered against stretching carbon targets. Uh, we've invested in renewable energy, reduced energy consumption in our buildings, and really considered carefully how and where we're going to source our materials. So to become a net zero carbon business, we are taking the following five actions. If you please move to the next slide, please. Um, so the first step is to reduce our operational carbon emissions. Uh, our target is to reduce carbon emissions by 70% by 2030 from a 2013-14 baseline. Uh, as most of the operational carbon emissions for buildings are associated with energy consumption, we have also have an energy reduction target to reduce our en energy intensity by 40%. And really since setting our target, we reduce our en intense energy intensity by 22% and our absolute carbon emissions by 42%, which is fantastic, but there's, there's clearly still a, a long way to go. The second action is around investing in renewable energy. Uh, since 2016, we've procured 100% Rego-backed electricity and have an installed capacity of 1.4 megawatts of renewable on-site generation of solar panels, which is always almost halfway to achieving our 2030 target of three megawatts. Uh, of on-site renewable electricity generation by 2030. The third action of our strategy is to use an internal 
price of carbon to support us in assessing climate related risks and opportunity as we transition to net zero carbon. And the fourth action is to reduce our construction impact. You know, we're reducing our construction impacts by maximizing reuse of any existing assets to reduce the extent of construction or demolition required and using fewer materials to drive down both cost and carbon emissions. And really the fifth and final action involves offsetting the remaining carbon. So once carbon emissions have been minimized as far as possible, we'll direct funds to carbon offset projects which actively take carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, if you, uh, next slide, please. So I will now just briefly talk about what we've delivered at Oxford Westgate specifically, uh, being one of our properties. So Oxford Westgate is a shopping and leisure destination situated in the heart of Oxford, which went through comprehensive redevelopment around five years ago. The development was completed in October 2017 and is a 50-50 joint venture between Landsec and the Crown Estate. We were set a target by Oxford City Council of having the greenest shopping centre in the UK and have set an ambitious sustainability Im implementation plan which outlined 45 different sustainability targets. And as part of the development, we had calculated the embodied carbon of materials we were using so that the material source for construction had the lowest carbon footprint. Um, we've also embraced new efficient technologies. For example, the shopping centre includes LED lighting, air source heat pumps, as well as a 30 kilowatt solar PV system. We've also undertaken a number of sustainability transport initiatives, uh, which includes the construction of a new car park with 50 electric vehicle chargers and the construction of a new bus link with seven bus stands. So as part of our current operation to be in line with our net zero carbon strategy, we have we continuously look to identify and implement energy reduction measures to lower the energy intensity of our buildings, including Oxford Westgate. So our view is that the climate crisis, you know, is becoming a greater threat and the next 10 to 20 years will certainly bring a rise in urban pollution, inhospitable weather and public sentiment and investment, investor attitude that favours sustainable development and operations. And really to meet this challenge, we must be really bold in our sustainability commitments. And we strongly believe that collaborative action will be imperative to achieving this. And really the partnership with the Zero Oxford Summit really provides a fantastic opportunity for us to work, to work along alongside all of you uh, to drive carbon emission reductions on a citywide basis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Um, the next speaker is Cathy Willis, who is the principal of St Edmund Hall and speaks here on behalf of the Conference of Colleges, I believe. So, Cathy, over to you. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for the invite to talk this morning very briefly. I'm also a professor of biodiversity in the university and work very uh, closely with the university on things like natural capital and understanding how we use our natural environments to also help achieve this target of net zero. Uh, first slide, please. So one of the things that I've been leading over the last 18 months is a working group for all the colleges, 39 colleges that represent the university. And one of the key things we first of all started to look at was to say, what are the colleges already doing? Because I think there is a mindset right the way across the city and outside that we have these old historic buildings that are where there's very little going on in terms of environmental initiatives. This report will be released later on this month. and I do hope everyone, um, we make sure you all get a copy because the one thing we have found when we've started to look at this is that over 300 actions are currently ongoing in the college buildings to try and reduce our energy, um, particularly looking at moving to things like sustainable uh, heating systems, ground source heat pumps, etc., water saving initiatives, biodiversity enhancement, and very much waste reduction as well. Uh, next slide, please. But one of the key things I think we're, we need to start with, and I think this is true of absolutely everyone that's in this arena, is first of all knowing what our current baseline is, because without a baseline, you can't set your targets. And quite often we're all shooting down the let's go down to the net zero without actually realizing where we're coming from. And this is, this is true of the colleges. So we've been carrying out using a common format. We've carried out, been carrying out a baseline audit to look at waste, energy, water, and how much biodiversity we possess in each college, and more broadly, right the way the other lands that many of the colleges own within and outside of Oxfordshire. From that, we have our next step, now we're doing these audits, which will be completed by the end of the summer, is to set meaningful reduction targets based on these current baselines. So zero carbon, very much tying in with this fantastic initiative being led by the City Council, and also net biodiversity gain. We very much see these aligned together. 
we, can, we need both. Um, and if we just shoot down one of them, we may well lose sight of the other, particularly the biodiversity. My final slide, please. So I just wanted to give you some examples of these initiatives. So, so the, third, the third thing, once we know our targets, of course, we then have to come up with a, to work out how we're going to use a combination of natural and technological solutions to meet targets. And so this is the solar panels on the roof of LMH. I understand there are solar panels now on top of the roof of the um, city council building. Um, and I think this is really important that every opportunity we have in here, there's also a rather ugly air source heat pump at Walson College here, but these are the sort of technological solutions looking to work with the council in terms of electric vehicles, in terms of, and I know the vice chancellor was talking about the transport strategy, but it's also about how do we increase the biodiversity that can also help us in this area. And I just wanted to show you this slide, just to show you what is already possible so this is from the national tree map. It's a satellite image based, um, it, you, it's, it's freely available satellite imagery. Red are the tallest tree. So that red tree outside the Natural History Museum is, is the sequoia tree. And it goes up to think about, uh, that's about seven or eight meters high. Uh, the blues are the lowest trees. Now, if you know the height of the tree and its species and its age, which you can all get from this remote, uh, data from that you can work out the carbon sequestration and storage that is available on an individual tree basis and so this is one of the areas where we're going to enhance woodland and enhance forestry and enhance biodiversity to help us in that small step towards achieving the same this is one of the granularity and the level of detail we need to start to look at in order to achieve this and the only way we're going to do this is by working all in partnership across the city and beyond. And this is why we as the conference of colleges really welcome this initiative and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Cathy. Um, our next speaker is from BMW and we are delighted to have with us today Alexandra Schneider, who's the Director of Finance and Compliance at BMW. Yes, good morning to everyone. Um, First of all, I would, would want to thank you uh, for the invitation. And we are really proud uh, of being um, invited to be a partner in the zero carbon, uh, uh, low emission, uh, or zero emission, sorry, uh, partnership. Um, showing you the, um, a little bit about plant, uh, mini plant Oxford. This is actually a plant which is uh, over 100 years old. We are very proud of hosting actually the brand MINI, producing um, all MINI models. And uh, we had a total production volume about uh, 222,000 cars in 2019 and a little uh, less in 2020 due to the pandemic. Um, we produce only to give you a glimpse uh, about uh, 1,000 cars uh, each day. And uh, we have uh, in the plant 4,500 workers from all uh, different countries, uh, around 70 uh, worldwide. So um, we are very diverse as well. Um, actually, this partnership, uh, maybe you can move uh, to, to the next slide. Um, the partnership um, uh, we have uh, with you actually fits very well into the uh, corporate goals uh, of uh, BMW Group and of course also Mini Plant Oxford um, because uh, we um, actually uh, have also uh, the same target to reduce um, uh, CO2 emissions um, by uh, uh, 30 percent until 2030 and um, if you also look at our uh, fleet, we have uh, the, the uh, target to have 25 uh, electrified models um, by 2023. And we already have uh, a market share in Europe of electric vehicles of 50%. So um, we had a sale increase last year, 2020, by 30% for electric vehicles and 40% by plug-in hybrids. And um, also we are very proud of that uh, within Europe in the major cities, we already uh, have uh, BMW e-drive zones installed where our plug-in hybrids actually switch automatically to an electric uh, vehicle um, drive. So, um, the, uh, if you maybe switch to the next uh, page. At Mini Plant Oxford, we already uh, are 
on our way uh, to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, we are actually um, are on this journey for a long time already, also from a corporate perspective. Um, as you know, um, in the last partnership we had with City Council of Oxford uh, in 2015, we also highlighted that uh, we have um, solar panels uh, on the roofs of uh, the um, production uh, facility and plant uh, Oxford. Uh, beyond that, actually, uh, our target is uh, to um, be CO2 neutral in production. And uh, in mini plant Oxford, we already um, purchase green electricity. Um, beyond that, if you look uh, into the future, our aim is um, to reduce uh, um, the CO2 uh, emission by minus 80%. And this is uh, on the global corporate uh, scale. So um, actually the partnership fits really well into our overall corporate, but also mini plant Oxford targets. And we are really happy um, to be part of uh, this. And uh, we are looking forward to the um, uh, innovation and also discussion groups we are, um, will participate in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that's really great. So thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, and the next speaker on my list is Professor Alistair Fitt, Vice-Chancellor of Oxford Brookes University. Alistair. Hello, good morning, you. everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and talking to you all. I know we're short of time, so I will be brief. Um, historically, Oxford Brookes has actively delivered carbon emission reduction actually right across our estates and operations. And, in 2019-20, we achieved a 35% reduction in absolute carbon emissions compared to our 2010 baseline, and that has already exceeded our 2025 34% target. Um, our new 2021 energy and carbon reduction strategy is currently in the process of being finalized, but I can promise you that it will contain ambitious targets contributing to Oxford City's zero carbon 2040 target, uh, and it will be delivered by a range of things, um, including improving the efficiency of buildings and their systems. We've already heard how important buildings are to Oxford's carbon reduction, future-proofing our redevelopment works, moving towards new and renewable forms of heating, and driving further institutional change through improvements to the university's policies and procedures. Each year, we already directly invest more than a quarter of a million pounds in carbon reduction and energy efficiency measures. Uh, but this investment, of course, is just the tip of the iceberg as the green agenda is further integrated into our organization through the use of our Salix Revolving Green Fund and the substantial financial investments we continue to make in modernizing our estate. And perhaps I should just close by saying, of course, the biggest challenge is not funding this or building challenges, it's affecting people's behaviors. We need to affect the behaviors of all our staff and students to make sure that they do everything that we need them to do to get to this target. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alistair, and uh, a very good concluding point. Um, uh, over to you, David Wallacher, Chief Digital and Partnership Officer at Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. Hi, hey, uh, good morning, everybody. We're uh, delighted to be here today to work with local partners to achieve the net zero emission plans for Oxford. Uh, this matches well with the wider NHS ambitions to become a net zero health service by 2040. The health and care system in England is responsible for around four to five percent estimated of UK carbon footprint. So we have a major role to play in supporting this both from the wider NHS plans, but specifically for Oxford as an anchor organisation with three hospitals in the city. As a large um, organisation, we recognise our responsibility for sustainability of our environment. And like others, we have a long way to go with some unique challenges. Uh, medicines, including anaesthetic gases and inhalers account for about 25% of emissions within the NHS. We are already making some big changes at the Trust. Uh, for example, in terms of ensuring our new estate is built with more sustainable methods, switching to low energy LED lighting, uh, which has been recently awarded with some public sector decarbonisation um, grants and promoting active travel and electric vehicles amongst our staff. We want to build on this work um, some of the changes we made due to the COVID pandemic, such as virtual consultations, 
has, has helped. So since March, we've undertaken over 100,000 video consultations and 300,000 telephone appointments. And as we move to recover from the pandemic, we will continue to use virtual appointments for uh, patients where it's clinically appropriate to reduce their needs to travel to our sites and to care for more of our patients in the comforts of their own home. However, conversely, some elements of our response to the pandemic have potential to increase our impact on the environment, such as single use um, PPE. There are key areas we'll focus on above, including the states, medicine, supply chain, travel, transport, food, catering, nutrition, as well as research and innovation. And we are developing a sustainability strategy to match the NHS national strategy and the local ambitions set out today. And we look forward to working closely with everybody here to accelerate our decarbonization, uh, decarbonization plans together. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Um, Nick, uh, Nick Broughton is the Chief Executive of uh, Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust. And over to you, Nick. Thank you for coming. Absolute pleasure. And it's great to be here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the fact that I'm here today and joined by our chairman, David Walker, is, I think, a reflection of how seriously we take this matter as an organisation. We are absolutely committed to becoming a zero carbon organisation. It features in our strategic objectives, which recently have been revised. Um, I think, as has already been alluded to, the pandemic that we are in the midst of has demonstrated the arts of the possible. As an organisation, we typically undertake in excess of 7 million business miles a year. That figure has reduced by two thirds over the last 10 months. And we are very committed to hardwiring some of the changes that we've seen uh, during the course of the COVID-19 response into how we undertake uh, business going forward and how we provide services going forward. Uh, we are already one of the leading organisations providing video consultations. Uh, we're doing that uh, to the tune of several thousand a day, and we plan to maintain that going forward. As an organisation, our services extend well beyond uh, the city of Oxford and indeed well beyond Oxfordshire. But we do have a number of sites in the city, including two of our largest sites, uh, namely those at Littlemore uh, and um, at the Warnerford Hospital. Um, as colleagues may be aware, we have plans already in train to redevelop the Warnerford site. Uh, and central to those plans is an ambition that the mental health unit we build should be a state-of-the-art facility which has one of the lowest carbon footprints of any mental health unit in the world. Uh, and that is first and foremost in our thinking. Uh, we are aware of the importance of this agenda because it's what our patients want us to do. We are aware of the impact of uh, um, the environmental changes on people's physical and mental health. I'm also very aware that the six and a half thousand people that we employ across Oxford Health expect us to take this agenda forward at pace and for it to be a priority for us as a senior leadership team of the, of the organisation. So it's great to be here. Uh, we are very enthused by uh, the summit, very enthused by what we've heard uh, already today uh, and are passionately committed to taking forward this agenda with you all and making Oxford City an exemplar for other parts of the country to follow. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. That's uh, that's really helpful. Um, the next person I have on my list uh, is Ahmed Goga from Oxfordshire Local uh, Enterprise Partnership, um, who he's the director of strategy and programmes there. So, Ahmed, over to you. Thank you, Susan, and good morning to everyone. Oxlep uh, is delighted to be part of this morning's uh, summit. We have worked very closely with the city and uh, other partners in developing the Oxfordshire Energy Strategy, which committed the county to achieving net zero by 2050 or sooner. So the ambitions that now are being set out in the Charter very much are driving so that our thinking and moving forward on that agenda. Alongside our partnership work, we've been working very closely in making sure our investments support the clean growth and clean tech sectors and advancing net zero ambitions. We've invested in significant projects across the county, including the Plant Sciences Centre at the university to advance new thinking on uh, clean growth, uh, agriculture and forestry, as well as significant investments in uh, the Earth Lab uh, down in uh, uh, the south of the county, and also importantly projects that are going to facilitate and advance uh, thinking around clean uh, growth skills and uh, supporting next generation of skills in uh, construction and also in agriculture and in other clean tech technology. And we're proud to continue to make those investments. We are, were one of the first partners to support the first Passive House Plus business centre up at Bista, and we're going to continue to build on those activities uh, which are set out in the industrial strategy, including a new energy systems accelerator based at Osney, led by the university, which will transform the way in which energy systems are developed and applied 
across the country as well. Alongside those investments, we continue to promote uh, uh, the fantastic ecosystem we have here, which we're truly blessed with. And it's really important part of our, the charter, I think, that we advance those highly uh, visible and highly exciting projects that are being taken forward, that are building on things like the national energy demonstrator pilots we have here with the Superhub and also with Project LEO. And all of those things will work together to promote at COP26 as part of our strong visibility there uh, in Glasgow. So we're really excited to be part of this uh, initiative and will continue to support over the course of the next uh, year and more. Thank you, Susan. Thanks very much, Ahmed. Um, the next person I'm going to turn to is uh, Barbara Hammond um, from Low Carbon Hub. So Barbara, over to you. Thanks very much, Susan, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say just a few words. Um, the Low Carbon Hub is a group of local social enterprises uh, that is going to be celebrating its 10th birthday uh, this coming December. And we wouldn't be here and doing what we are with communities right across the city and the county um, and catalyzing uh, a lot of local activity around uh, the transition to zero carbon without the partnerships uh, that have been available to us through the previous low carbon Oxford, um, through uh, Oxlep, um, through the amazing support that we get from the city council, the county council, and increasingly the district council. So I just wanted to say partnership is absolutely crucial to solving these problems. I'm really pleased that Low Carbon Oxford has now become Zero Carbon Oxford. That's amazing uh, progress since we started back in 2010 when I was the first director of Low Carbon Oxford. Um, so congratulations to the city council for uh, getting to this point with Zero Carbon Oxford and I really hope that it is a huge success and as successful as the partnerships we've had all the way through to date. Thank you. I knew I'd do it at some point, forget to unmute myself, but uh, thank, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, I, I've got, I, I'm now kind of reaching some of the people who haven't yet confirmed whether or not they wanted to speak. So um, uh, Phil Waddup's confirmed he doesn't. Um, Mark Beard, did you want to say anything? Um, Susan, I'm very happy to carry on listening. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it so far. Absolutely fine. <laughs> Thank you. No one's obliged to speak, so uh, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, and the next person I had on my list was Richard Dick. Uh, again, uh, Richard um, from the Lucy Group, did you want to say anything? Yes, please. Right. So, thank Thanks. you very much. Uh, welcome the opportunity to say a few words this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Lucy Group, we're a diversified company in three areas very relevant to today's discussion, which is electrical distribution networks, street lighting and smart cities, uh, and managing and owning real estate. And we employ about 2,000 people in the UK and around the world. Uh, and those people are all very committed to this sort of cause, I might say. And we've been, uh, our headquarters have been in Jericho for over 200 years, so we're very committed to Oxford as a city, and we have about 450 residential properties and a residential development arm. Our main factory is in Tame, and that has a 250 kilowatt solar installation. Uh, a lot of our approach is not just about net carbon, but about environment in general, social and economic sustainability. Uh, and a key challenge, I think, for all businesses is to establish a satisfactory sustainability framework to give a co coherent understanding across each business. So I'll just very briefly tell you some of the things that uh, we are doing. Um, as a group, we are reporting CO2 emissions now uh, in line with the greenhouse gas protocol. And we think that's a very important thing to do. Uh, and this enables us to measure year on year uh, and to publicly announce our achievements in carbon reduction. Uh, we're also developing a group-wide sustainability framework uh, using the 17 UN development goals, which were mentioned by a previous speaker. And at the moment, we are prioritizing trying to achieve six of them. Uh, and as a whole, we are very much aimed at reducing waste. And, uh, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say that several of our sites now have achieved zero landfill, which we think is very important. In terms of uh, electrical ability, uh, Lucy provide intelligent power network solutions that drive energy efficiency in existing networks, and particularly enable network capacity and installation to be measured remotely. And this is going to be absolutely crucial in determining where new network investments needed 
uh, as we decarbonize and electrical consumption goes up. We also specialize in equipment for connecting renewable energy sources. And I would say here the issue isn't actually about the availability of technology, uh, but to some extent the will, energy and skills to install it all. I think this is going to be a major job for utilities uh, uh, in the coming years, and if someone from Sutherland Scottish Energy speaks later, they might comment on this. We're also very focused on electric vehicle infrastructure. We're currently working on a potential as a potential supplier uh, for the rollout of the 150 uh, uh, charging stations in the 24 car parks in Oxford and Oxfordshire, and around uh, the country, Tesla and BP are typical customers of ours as we help to. Uh, electrify and supply points in service stations. We also have in, in street lighting, um, we are, are very engaged in the supply of smart street lighting, which enables not only street lighting, but areas like pollution control remotely. And we should be shortly bidding for OCC's new street lighting upgrade, which we hope might include a central management system. And in terms of our properties, uh, for all new builds, we're now providing electric vehicle charging points for every unit. Uh, we're providing space for battery storage fitting for the future. And in most cases, we're fitting heat pumps uh, as standard where we can. In our, uh, in our existing uh, car parks within Oxford, we have quite a few. We're installing a gradual program of EV charging points. We're going to be investing this year in electric vans uh, for all our maintenance teams, and this will reduce, obviously, the use of the diesel ones in and around the city. On a slightly wider note, over the last few years, we've been installing biodiversity gardens in all our properties where we can uh, to include things like bug hotels, encouraging hedgehogs, uh, pollinators, and especially for bees, which we think is also very important. We're very keen to work with the city on a framework. This is a great initiative, and we welcome the opportunity to exchange views and knowledge to improve uh, this and achieve, help you achieve your very ambitious target. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, and I'm now going to call on Rachel White, uh, who joins us for another uh, significant local employer, Nielsen. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for inviting Nielsen today. We're really pleased to be part of this. Um, as some of you might be aware, Nielsen. We are a global company, but we have had our, our UK arm, as it were, established in Oxford for over eight years. And we take our responsibility, therefore, to be part of the Oxford community very seriously. And, um, and I'm very pleased to be part of working with you on Oxford Zero Carbon objectives. As part of our Nielsen uh, global policy on global sustainability, as well as looking at our own footprint, we also do contribute to the global debate on the footprint of our industry, which is primarily food and drink. And we share our data with the United Nations for their Sustainable Development Initiative. So we do that alongside, as well as looking, as I mentioned, at our own zero carbon footprint, both globally and then how that's been implemented locally. At a local um, Oxford level, you probably may be aware that we um, built a, a sustainable and an energy efficient site on the New York Business Park um, as of 2018. That site does include uh, over 16 electric car spaces, 100 um, spaces for cycles, um, and in addition, allocated designated car parking to encourage car sharing, as well as a substantial reduction of, um, in the number of car parking spaces in this new office from our previous building. We do have um, a sustainable travel policy in place and we have quite an aggressive five year plan on how to reduce individual car reliance um, for, for the office. And that has come about in kind of a number of ways, as a few ways that we're doing that is, is one having a review of our flexible working hour policy to remove and reduce uh, pressure on the commuting times. We are a business that, um, as an agency, we are asked to visit and travel to clients' buildings throughout the UK and global. So we are reducing our need to be on site and looking at ways to reduce travel across, across the board. Um, and in addition to that, we've also been changing our benefits package to encourage individuals to purchase more efficient cars and work from home and also adjusting our company car policy, which will now be an electric and hybrid fleet. And we will be funding the electric points at our associate houses who take up those cars. So 
we're doing some aspects at the local level, but we're very pleased to be here to listening to all the great initiatives that are happening in Oxford and understanding how we can hopefully play more of a part in that going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, next on my list is Neil Clark, and Neil is the Corporate Responsibility Advisor for the Environment for Oxfam GB, and we have some slides, or a slide, I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> just the one, please, yeah. If you just put that forward, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Um, so it's a real delight to be here. Um, I'm here today on behalf of our Chief Executive, uh, Danny Shris Kandaraja, and Oxfam very much look forward to working with you on this partnership over the coming years. I just wanted to use this moment to highlight two points of relevance to today's meeting. Uh, firstly, uh, in late 2020, we published a new strategy called For a Radically Better World, in that the climate emergency is noted as a key cause of extreme vulnerability and inequality for the world's poorest communities. So I'm really grateful to Councillor Hayes for the opening remarks that set that global context so clearly, so thank you. To complement that strategy, in early 2020, we developed our own carbon reduction commitment in that we have set a provisional target of at least a 66% reduction in absolute CO2 equivalent emissions by 2030. As at 2019-20, that uh, we've reduced our emissions by 44%. Um, and in scope of our target, we are including our emissions across GB for scope one, uh, scope two and within scope three we include uh, GB process flights and staff business mileage. The percentage reduction noted above will be confirmed in time for the next uh, UN climate summit um, due later this year um, and I'll be working on a review this summer with a key aim to see if we can increase that 2030 percentage from 66%. The target that 66% that, uh, is from our 2011-12 baseline and we intend to do, uh, reach that target without soft offsetting. And that's without offsetting, certainly for the foreseeable future, but accepting that ultimately to reach zero or net zero offsets are inferred. So our approach here is in part so that we can focus on the strong decarbonisation options that exist in our own operations, and in part due to the concerns that Oxfam have around the social and environmental risks that such projects can sometimes have. Uh, and we're committed to being zero carbon by 2045 at the latest. And the key there is the word latest. Um, the work I'm doing this summer will also be looking to see if we can bring that date forward as well. And then even after the review that we do this summer, we, you know, we're making an ongoing annual commitment to review uh, the targets, the percentage and the, the end year date um, as new technology and opportunities become available. So really looking forward to being part of this partnership. Thank you much for your time and it's back to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. That's brilliant. Um, and we are now over to Phil Southall, who is the Finance and Commercial Director of Oxford Bus Company. I wish I was Susan, I'm the Managing Director. But, uh, <laughs> but, I thought, as I said that, that didn't sound right, but <laughs> that's what I said on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do the numbers. <laughs> yes. Okay. So thank you, uh, Susan, and congratulations to the uh, to the city council on on both the getting us together for this summit and the uh, zero carbon charter. Uh, we're very pleased to participate and, and play our part too. So I've just got a couple of brief slides here to uh, give you an idea of what we've been up to and, and where we're hoping to go. Um, so on the far left here, we've got uh, Barbara Hammond and our finance and commercial director, the real one, uh, up on the roof of our depot. Um, in, in, in Cowley. Um, this was an initiative we've done with the Low Carbon Hub as Luke is, works with Barbara in partnership and, and the, that's important as she outlined earlier on, on low carbon initiatives and has done for a number of years. Um, this was installed back in our depot in October 2013, you know, many years ago now, and we actually had a letter from David Cameron at the time because we were the first um, company to actually do this um, and, and sort of trailblaze putting um, these are on, on depot roofs and we've now generated 800,000 kilowatt hours since that was done and that's been really good we've actually self-sufficient at our depot on a Sunday um, as a result of that so that, that's really positive positive. Uh, we've also done lots of LED lighting uh, at both our Oxford and, and Didcot depots and reduced our energy consumption by 25 percent and on the far right we, we built on what we did in Oxford and put solar panels on our roof in Didcot uh, in September 2019 through the same arrangement with the low carbon hub with Barbara um, and that's already generated more than 60,000 kilowatt hours uh, saving 20 tonnes of carbon dioxide a year so they've all been good initiatives over and above our vehicles and we'll move on to the next slide please uh, which 
uh, is onto our main business, which is running vehicles where we can make a contribution. So um, on the far left, we uh, introduced Oxford's first electric um, double deck bus um, back in, in, in February of, of, of last year for our city sightseeing services. Uh, we've now had a second bus converted and that's now back um, at the garage. Uh, unfortunately, the process to convert retrofitting uh, the technology in is quite a torturous process. So it's taking much longer than we were envisaging. But uh, when, when we have got them here, and, and we hope to have them both on the road when we can resume sightseeing tours later this year, um, charging involves an innovative battery storage solution, which has helped support local energy uh, trials in Oxford as well. But the bigger, and, and that's what the middle picture is showing, is where, where our charger is uh, in the garage with the electric bus. But our, our, our biggest um, contribution is obviously through our, our vehicles that we run throughout the city. So, so our carbon emissions per vehicle mile have been steadily declining um, each year since, since, since 2013. Uh, we've continued to in, increase uh, the number of ultra low emission buses in our fleet. And I'm pleased to say we now have 178 of these across Oxfordshire and more than three quarters of the total that we currently run. And we're obviously working towards um, the first phase of, of the uh, zero emission zone for buses, which is, which is to have more Euro 6s by uh, December of this year. Uh, and 92 of our buses are electric. But we have um, a huge opportunity now. Um, I mean, our, our parent company, Go Ahead Group, has pledged to have a completely zero emission fleet by, by 2035. Um, but we have an opportunity, obviously, to accelerate this uh, now with the um, electric bus city opportunity, where, where Oxford uh, is on a short list of two, um, with, with the Department for Transport to try and fund a completely electric bus city. So all buses would be at zero emission of some sort. You know, it, it, it is possible we could do that as early as 2027. But that's going to require very strong local partnership because what it's going to mean in reality is extensive bus priority, delivery of all the connecting Oxford initiatives that will identify the workplace parking levy, traffic filters um, and everything else. Because without that, we, we won't be able to get the business case to stack up because in effect, an electric bus costs twice as much as a diesel, even a very clean diesel bus. It still costs twice as much. So therefore, we're going to have to speed the buses up in order to get more people onto the buses in order to pay for that extra investment. Because what we can't do is ask customers to pay a significant amount more for their bus travel just because we've turned it into an electric bus. And um, so the economics of it don't stack up without speeding the buses up, generating more patronage and making sure that more people um, get on the buses. But it is an exciting time. It is a huge opportunity for us to accelerate um, our journey to zero emissions. And we very much look forward to working with both the City Council and the County Council on trying to deliver that ambition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Phil. Um, uh, the next person on my list is um, Paul James, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the River Learning Trust. Uh, so, um, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Paul James, um, the Chief Exec of RLT, which is a multi-academy trust of 24 schools the majority of which are in Oxfordshire. So we are responsible for the education of around about 12,000 pupils. We have about 1,700 uh, colleagues working in our schools and a third um, of those people uh, are within our um, eight schools that also sit within the Oxford city uh, boundary. Um, as a number of delegates have said here this morning we're delighted and really excited to be involved in this conversation and this work um, in the years ahead um, I think there's alongside of course our education uh, commitments um, and helping uh, our young people our, our children and our adults within our organization be far better informed um, uh, in terms of sustainability and the, and the changes that we can all make um, other strands for us in terms of our developing, and I think that's fair to say, developing strategy um, uh, is focused on our estate. So we have a number of our schools, not a huge number, but a number of our schools have LED lighting uh, and we continue to roll that out. We've just had a, a large grant to enable more of our schools to, to have those. We have some schools with solar panels and our newest, we're able to learn through the construction of some of our newer schools of the direction of travel of um, far better and more efficient heating systems. But of course, to, to do any sort of retrofit on some of our older school buildings is very, very challenging uh, due to the expense. And um, we're very keen to learn from uh, partners engaged in, in this work to help um, us to uh, sort of meet more ambitious targets in the years ahead. Uh, we're also working with our, and looking at our suppliers in terms of their own uh, work 
uh, around sustainability and the longevity of the materials. So we invest, of course, each year on in the in our capital estate and trying to make sure that those investments uh, leads to sort of long term sustainable changes um, for our for our schools. Um, so we're we're delighted to to be involved. I think uh, the other strand of conversation for us. Um, and engagement is around the transport strategy um, with the challenges that exist for uh, teacher recruitment and, and affordable housing and so on. Uh, we know that working closely with uh, the city council in terms of transport and um, public transport, EV charging points and so on and so forth in schools will, will also be an important part um, of the discussion and work for us. So thank you, Susan. Thank you. And obviously, also your pupils who are um, uh, will keep us all in line, I think, uh, on these issues. So <laughs> thank you very much, Paul. Um, that's brilliant. Uh, the next person on my list is Mel Bryce, who's the Oxfordshire Programme Director for Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks. Uh, so, um, Mel, over to you. OK, thank you very much, Susan, and thank you very much to the Council for putting this event together. It's great to see so many like minded people together on a call like this. So um, I'm from Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks, and we operate the distribution network. So everything from the cutout in your house right the way through to the um, grid supply point. Um, we own, operate and maintain 11,000 kilometres of um, overhead line and underground cables in Oxfordshire and over 6,000 substations. So we're really pleased to be here um, taking part in the Zero Carbon Partnership and really want to help to get the emissions targets that we need. Um, obviously, as an electricity network, the decarbonisation of heat and transport is going to be paramount. Um, demand is due to increase and the networks are going to be really crucial for that transition. So in order for that transition to take place, we need to look at the whole energy system and collaborations such as this are going to be absolutely essential so that we can build up um, plans from the very bottom. So as well as being in SSEN, I'm also the lead on the innovation project LEO, Local Energy Oxfordshire, um, that's specifically set up to help achieve the government's net zero targets. And we're looking at um, setting up pilot projects to demonstrate flexibility on the electricity networks so that we can free up more space for um, low carbon technologies such as electric vehicles and heat pumps um, without having to reinforce the network. So we're looking very much at the social, economic and environmental benefits of this and also producing evidence to um, support policies and investments to create the conditions for change. We're running small trials at the moment, but um, we're hoping to expand more across Oxfordshire and we'll be looking for people to take part in those trials as we go forward. And um, coming at the end of, or towards the end of everybody who's speaking, I can pick up on a few points from before. And I think Alistair was talking about behavioural change. And I absolutely agree that behavioural change is going to be um, key to getting to the targets that we need. And I think Richard had a point on skills and that was something else that I had wanted to talk about. And that was the change that we're going to need um, for new skills for things like digitization and the sort of analysis that we're going to need and cyber security um, as we move forward um, to the green economy. So, so yes, we're really looking forward to joining you and, um, you know, moving forward to, to a better world of energy and getting to um, the zero carbon that we're after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, the next speaker I have on my list is Dr. Nick Small, who's the Head of Built Environment at Stagecoach in Oxfordshire. So, Nick, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, really interesting points made by so many people, and uh, there's no point remaking them. Um, I think it's, as we start, if you want to just move to the next slide, please. It's just got a couple of slides. I think one of the points that we've yet to make uh, in, in any depth is that transport is the only contributor to the UK's carbon footprint where that contribution is rising absolutely and relatively for various reasons. And it's also very clear and become very clear to government that bus must play and coach must play a much greater role. So the idea that we are somehow tangential to the challenge, the national as well as the local and, and, and the city challenge of decarbonisation, you know, even government has realised that, that we have to be centre stage. And it's a huge responsibility for stagecoaches as one of 
Britain's biggest bus operators uh, alongside uh, Phil Southall's businesses, um, and one that we take extremely seriously. As, as many have said over the last uh, hour and a half or so, uh, this, this movement, this, um, you, you know, the, the journey towards uh, zero carbon for our business is not one that we've recently embarked on. It's one that we've been on for many years. We were the first major, well, first public transport operator to achieve zero carbon accreditation, not zero carbon, uh, carbon trust accreditation for our business um, way back in about 2012, I think it was. So uh, quite some time ago. And we've taken consistent action and made concerted investment over 15 years. And those investments have been driven by uh, data by very clear audit processes, exactly the things that many others have said. Uh, we um, took action to put those audit trails in um, way back in, in the late noughties. Um, so we've been on it this journey for well over a decade. So just last year, we managed to chip away at our um, seat kilometre carbon intensity by 4%. Um, and that adds to a 14% reduction in, in, in overall enterprise light for light carbon intensity over the last five years. So we are pushing and we will continue to push as far and fast as we can well ahead of regulatory drivers. We have been in the lead. We are um, absolutely committed to innovation as a business. Um, we have uh, throughout our national and, and at times we've had international exposure to this uh, across our businesses. We have been um, really pioneering um, technologies that were at the bleeding edge, and um, we knew they were. And um, we've been prepared to put money into things where we've really been very unclear um, what the outcomes would be, but we knew we needed to start to grapple with the practicalities and the engineering um of, of the technology's concerns so things like biofuel we had a biofuel fleet uh, operating in 2006 100 percent zero carbon then um across a fleet in scotland in, in kilmarnock we have been one of the leaders in, in hydrogen deployment at scale uh, in, in aberdeen uh the largest bus uh, hydrogen bus fleet in europe um Electric vehicles as well, where we, um, you know, are pressing fast into this with one of the biggest EV bus fleets outside London um, in, in Manchester that's entered service within the last 18 months. So we, 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 you know, we're pushing hard and fast as best as we can. And it isn't just about technology. It isn't just about, although, you know, it isn't just about buses and vehicles, although that's vitally important. It's about how we work creatively and collaboratively to reduce the carbon intensity of mobility more generally and make sure that that we are uh, playing our part to, to offer products if you like to the public that allow them to reduce their own carbon intensity as they move around and make those journeys that they want and need to make along with go ahead we've also um committed to zero carbon by by 2035 so we go to the next slide and and very simply People have talked about skills. People have talked um, about behavior change. Um, people have talked rightly about partnership. This is clearly be beyond any one organization or sector. Um, and Tom Hayes started off the, the session today talking about hope. Um, we, we're gonna need that. This is gonna be a very long journey and it's gonna be one with many setbacks. The task is huge and it's for transport operators, it's even bigger than most. So we're going to need whole new ways of thinking, um, whole new behaviours. Um, we're going to need a lot of courage. We're going to need to increase our collaboration. We're going to need to increase our skills and understanding and draw from areas that we've never drawn from before in terms of how we run our business, how we deploy technology at scale. And it's really about, and this is the last point, we have 800 people at Stagecoach in Oxfordshire alone, thousands across the nation. We are going to need to engage all of our people um, within Stagecoach to bring their, 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 their intent, to bring their creativity, to bring their passion, um, to bring their, 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 their ingenuity, not just on these big issues, but on the day to day of how we make this work. Um, we, 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 and that is something that we are absolutely able to pledge 
is that we are going to reshape our business, not just around technology, but about the values and the behaviours that are necessary to facilitate um, the, 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 the journey that we're on and to make sure we get there. Because without those changes in our culture, we are really going to struggle. And, and we uh, look forward to sharing that journey, not just about the technology, but about the, the way in which um, we are leveraging our people uh, with you all over the years, um, and it will be years uh, to come. I think that's, uh, hopefully I have not gone on too long. Thank you very much, Nick. Really appreciate it. Um, there have been so many incredibly valuable points made today. It's um, I'm glad it's being recorded because uh, I, I frankly want to watch it back over again. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Jeremy Long from the chair of the, uh, the Local Economic Partnership. If, if you are able to speak briefly, I will call you. Susan, promise I will. Um, thank you. Ahmed's already, I think, covered how as Oxlet uh, we've been working on strategies and action plans and indeed fostering uh, carbon zero relevant businesses. I just wanted to pick up very quickly two threads. Um, the one that um, Paul and Mel have made about our young students here. And I think I'd very much like to continue for us as Oxlet to work with you and with the county and partners as to how we help those youngsters coming through make career choices, uh, gain the right kind of work experience, even ask the right questions as they come into the workplace about their would-be employers, because in so doing, we can influence employers' behaviour. And then secondly, uh, I'd like us to work with you as to how we can continue to publicise. There's been some fantastic examples this morning, I think, from amongst the workforce, the organisations employing staff uh, around the county today. I think we should go on looking how we create the publicity for exemplars in this area and in so doing also encouraging other employers either practically just to pick up examples or to feel that pressure to move in the same direction. Thank you very much. Thanks Jeremy um, and last but not least I'm going to call on Tom Hayes the Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Green Transport and Zero Carbon Oxford from Oxford City Council to make the final remarks in this this part of the session. Thanks Susan it's great to hear all of these examples of true leadership uh, good partners make for good partnership as you can hear we're really lucky in Oxford to have such excellent partnerships uh, this week, Oxford City Council has set a science-based detailed course to become net zero for our direct activities in this year and zero carbon in our underlying emissions by 2030 or sooner. We're no longer as a council in the business of carbon management, we're in the business of carbon elimination. By 2030, our activities will no longer contribute to that worsening climate crisis from our use of gas, electricity, water and fuel, so scopes one and two and some three emissions. We will no longer burn fossil fuels in our vehicles. Those vehicles will have transitioned to electric or zero emission, enabling us to also meet our cleanest air ambition. We've just become the first council in the country to set our air quality targets, and these are more stringent than the legal targets. We're not starting from scratch. Uh, we're upping our ambition. In the last six years, our underlying emissions have decreased by 23.5% and 45.8% in emissions after the purchase of only certified grid renewable electricity. We know that business as usual, consistently exceeding our 5% year on year reduction target will be insufficient. And so our ambition is to achieve a minimum of 10% annual emission reductions to get the job done. We're also in partnership rolling out Oxford zero emission zone this year. We're pushing on with connecting Oxford. We're seeking to address the congestion which can weaken our economy and we're backing the bus and active travel as dominant modes of getting around Oxford. to, so for example, shop sustainably at Westgate Oxford. At least 25% of our fleet will be electric by 2023. We and our wholly owned company, Oxford Direct Services Limited, are partners to the £41 million energy super hub, which will lead, among other things, to Oxford becoming the UK's largest EV charging hub this year. We're engaged with the £40 million project, Leo. We heard earlier about the importance of innovation. The City Council entirely agrees. And we're proud of our founding and ongoing funding role in low carbon hubs. We believe in community-owned and community-generated renewable energy, the growth of social enterprises as part of our inclusive economy, and the creation of energy systems as part of the creation of zero carbon systems, and the hub wears the council's values and its leads. Our other, house, our other company, Oxford City Housing Limited, is building council homes that are zero carbon for regulated energy use. 
Ground source heat pumps are going into Blackbird Lee's homes as part of Energy Superb Oxford. And our new local plan sets a course towards all new homes being net zero carbon by 2030. In our new budget, we propose to invest 50 million in the next decade to be spent on efficiency measures to our council housing stock. And I think most excitingly of all, we'll even have our first electric bin lorry quietly, very quietly collecting refuse so that we all get a good sleep. Um, and I think it's important that we can get a rest when we get it because we're all going to have to race a million miles an hour just to become zero carbon by 2040. But I know we can do it. And the procurement this week of nearly 11 million pounds to decarbonize the council has been encouraging. It will fund the decarbonization of our leakiest buildings and it will fill an enormous part of our funding gap. But we'll be filling that funding gap right now, nine years out from our 2030 zero carbon target. And lastly, although our carbon emissions account for 1% of citywide emissions, we want to play a leadership role by example, which is why we're doing these things. And we want to do that because every elected councillor in Oxford uh, City Council declared a climate emergency in 2019. The council um, held the first um, citizens assembly on climate change to be held by a UK city and 90% of members recommended that Oxford should aim to exceed the national target. In all of our subsequent engagements with the public, such as Oxford's Youth Climate Summit earlier this year, we have heard the same resounding message, go further, go faster. And as your representative and democratically elected body, we seek to fulfill the will of our public. Critically, that Citizens' Assembly, which was uh, held in 2019, called on the Council to work with partners, to set a strategy, to see how these goals could be achieved. And that's why we're all here today. The summit to which you're contributing is following the recommendation of our fellow citizens. By being here today, we're all doing our civic duty. We're all creating a better Oxford. I just want to close by thanking a small number of people. I want to thank my predecessor in this role, John Tanner, who helped to set up Low Carb in Oxford and who has helped to create so much of the momentum we're building, we're building on today. I want to thank those who have contributed to the council's work over many years, including Joe Colwell, and those who have made today possible. Uh, in particular, Councillor Susan Brown, who is nationally recognised as a local government leader for her climate leadership, and who had chaired the advisory group that established the Citizens' Assembly. I want to thank our chief scientist, Nick Eyre, and I want to thank uh, our officers, to name a few, Tom, Ruth, Lauren, Miss, and Tim, and our incoming and outgoing CEOs, Caroline and Gordon. And lastly, Rose, who we'll be hearing from shortly. Thanks for all of your contributions. The City Council is looking forward to standing alongside you. And as I was saying, going a million miles an hour to get to 2040. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're, we're nearly to time, so um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling too bad about the chairing of, 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 the, of, of today's session. So thank you, but thank you very much indeed for all the contributions. Um, I know you must have all felt you were racing through um, and there was so much more, I'm sure, that everybody could, could have said. Um, but I think what it has shown us is the huge wealth of knowledge, expertise and uh, exciting projects that are already going on uh, and therefore the importance of this partnership in, in being able to share some of that expertise. So um, I think that takes me nicely on to introducing Rose Dickinson, um, who is now going to talk to us uh, about our roadmap to a zero carbon city. And Rose is the carbon reduction team manager at Oxford City Council and has done uh, a lot of the work behind today, uh, today's um, summit. So Rose, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk through the City Council's work so far to produce a citywide roadmap and action plan to net zero. And I'll explain what the roadmap is and how it will help the Zero Carbon Oxford partnership in its work to accelerate emissions cuts within the city. So we've heard this morning from Professor Nick Eyre, who outlined why 2040 is the right target date for Oxford. And following this, the next questions facing us are, how do we get from where we are now to net zero within 20 years? And how do we maximise the benefits to Oxford and its residents in the process? So City Council has begun work to answer these questions by commissioning this roadmap to net zero. The roadmap will tell us three key things. The first is to set out the different scenarios facing Oxford as we plan for net zero. This will tell us how significant and important uncertainties that are outside the partnership's control, such as hydrogen availability and electricity network upgrades, will impact the city's transition to net zero before clarifying what our next steps should be. The second will be to set out the priorities for action by outlining a timeline of the key changes that are needed in the city between now and 2040. And the third is the action plan, 
which will set out the specific actions that are needed to get on track for net zero, with a particular focus on transport and buildings, which account for the bulk of the city's emissions, and on the first carbon target period over the next five years. The roadmap will look in detail at the areas where collaboration between partners could deliver the most in terms of emissions reduction. It will also identify some potential sources of funding for our work over the coming period. The idea is that this roadmap will provide the detailed information to define the topics for the first sprint groups and help plan in this activity by being clear about the timeframes involved for realising the benefits in terms of emissions reduction. The roadmap will also be clear about where further action is needed by central government, which could provide the basis for joint advocacy by partners in the coming years. Drafting is due to commence imminently with the final report ready in time for the first steering group meeting. We are about to review the responses received so far and we'll make a decision on who will be undertaking this work for us in the next couple of weeks. As the work of the partnership progresses and, and becomes more established, the idea is that this roadmap will be built upon and updated by partners. So in summary then, this document will provide the evidence base upon which the partnership can begin its work so that we can quickly take the big initial steps that are required to help get Oxford on track for net zero. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rose. Um, that's, that's excellent. Has anyone got any questions or comments at this particular uh, on this particular um, part of the discussion? I'm not seeing any um, comments and I don't think I can see any hands raised. So um, thank you. Um, in which case, um, I think we can probably move on to the next part of the agenda. Um, I, I should just warn you at this point that um, there seems to be some problem with our uh, with our broadband. So if I completely disappear, Tom, I'm afraid I'm going to have to hand over to you to chair the rest of it. But so far, so good. Oh, I still seem to be here. Um, so um, with the next part of the agenda is the signing of the Zero Carbon Oxford Charter. Um, and Everyone I think present has seen the charter and has had the opportunity to comment upon it um, and a number of changes have been made as a result of that. Um, the key points that we really obviously need to emphasise are that the target date for the city to reach net zero is 2040 um, and that we will all collaborate to support the city in reaching this target uh, and obviously the city is more than any of us as individual organisations um, you know we but our aim has to be to get everyone and everything in the city uh, to, to reach that target um, if, we're, if we're going to be effective. Um, and we will support that through the partnership working that we're doing. So we, we can't really do a physical signing ceremony as we're, we're, uh, we're all in our own homes uh, and, and offices as opposed to all in a big room together. Um, so what I'm going to do is to ask representatives of each organisation to indicate their support for the charter for the charter by a show of hands. So um, uh, I don't know whether you want to do that literally, if you can switch your cameras on um, and, and, and literally just sort of raise your hand like this. But um, if you're happy to do that or use a virtual hand, that would be fantastic. So I'm going to do both just to just to make sure that I'm completely signed up to to the to the charter. But um, uh, anyone I'm hoping that we've got most people now uh, virtually um, signing up to it. So uh, if anyone's counting, but um, has anyone felt unable to register their hand at this stage? I think we've we've seen uh, we've seen everyone virtually signalling that they they wish to. Um, that wish to support the charter so so thank you very much indeed we we will be announcing the organizations that support the charter in a press release following the summit um so um you you should see that going out i think most people will have contributed to that press release um so the the the, the next steps um which were proposed in the briefing material um included uh setting up of a steering group and future meetings um we've shared a document with everyone prior to the summit that sets out our proposal for how the partnership will operate um those details have not been completely finalized there is still room to change them if people have any concerns or good suggestions for how we we take things forward we absolutely welcome more feedback on that um, we do propose an annual meeting of the full partnership this 
this this this group of people um and hopefully we might even manage to make the next one face to face so uh you know fingers crossed um the steering group will meet twice a year to take key decisions about the partnership uh, and we'll be in touch shortly to make arrangements for the first meeting of the steering group which we anticipate taking place this summer and um, I'd invite you to think about who from your organisation you would want to be representing you on that steering group um, which will be very much about taking practical steps forward um, for each of our organisations and um, I think will be very valuable in terms of the networking opportunities so that we can cross-pollinate some of these excellent ideas that people have been talking about today. So some of the actions for that first meeting will include setting up the sprint groups, um, as we've called them, um, and agreeing the terms of reference for the partnership um, and making a decision about the resourcing of the partnership. Uh, that's to say what contributions this group may be seeking from partners. And again, your feedback on all of those points is very welcome. So throughout the year, there'll be sprint groups that will focus on collaborative action in specific areas. And the sprint, those, as I said, those sprint groups will be overseen by the steering group. And we have proposed some initial uh, sprint groups just to get things started. Um, sp specifically, we've suggested sprint groups focused on energy, transport and buildings would be good places to start. So again, uh, can I invite you to think about who from your organisations you might want to get involved in which of those groups? Um, and obviously, we don't expect everyone to have representation on every group um, it's completely reasonable to to focus on one and uh, that's most important to you um, and the roadmap once it's complete will, will help us with all of this um, and deciding on what other areas of focus might be necessary um, and uh, I think that's probably all I want to say um, on those next steps at this stage so again has anyone got any further comments or queries at this point? Just pausing to see, not seeing anyone indicating, so thank you. Okay, well, um, in which case, um, I just sort of calls upon me, it uh, falls upon me really to, to, to just make some concluding remarks then, um, if I may. So um, uh, firstly, thank you very much again to everybody who's who's come today. Um, I think it's been absolutely fascinating listening to all the exceptionally good work that's already going on. And, and I think um, I, I won't say I'm surprised because I did know that there was an awful lot of, of, of really good work going on in the city. And, and I think it's one of the reasons why I feel very optimistic about our ability to achieve this, because we are already doing such a lot. Um, and there are so many really senior people across our city who are really committed to this work. So it is really important that we we work together um, to make sure that we can we can absolutely make the most of it and deliver for our city. In 2010, um, many people who are here today uh, came together and founded Low Carbon Oxford. Um, and at that point, people came together in agreement that action was needed from all of us to avert climate breakdown. And we pledged at that point to significantly reduce our own carbon emissions and hold ourselves to a high standard. So we set the ambition, the ambitious aim of reducing the city's emissions by 40 percent in 10 years. And it now seems that we are on track to have achieved this target. So I think that just shows what you can do if you work together in partnership uh, and you set out challenging um, targets. So thank you. It's no small part to the hard work of the organisations that we collectively represent that that has been achieved. We've heard today some of the brilliant initiatives that have got us to this point, as well as some of the plans that will help keep us on the path of carbon reduction. And now we're more than a decade on from the founding of Low Carbon Oxford, we find ourselves in an extraordinary situation because we're, of course, facing not one crisis, but two. Uh, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has brought huge disruption. Um, but as we have already heard um, this morning, uh, there's some of the changes that have that we've all collectively made in response to the COVID-19 pandemic have actually helped with some of the uh, responses that we need to make in terms of the climate change crisis. 
So for instance, uh, 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't have imagined that we would be meeting like this with um, all of us meeting remotely from our own homes or from our offices, um, uh, rather than all gathering together, having traveled um, to, to, to meet up um, somewhere else. So there are some benefits and we've seen that um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. But um, we do need to make sure that we that the climate benefits of adopting and even brace and even embracing low carbon means of communicating and working are followed through and are, are made clear to people. Our situation has changed in other ways too. It's also true now that more people than ever regard climate change as a secret as a, as a serious concern. And there was actually a poll very recently in the last couple of days that found that 81 percent of people in this country now recognise that climate change is a serious problem. And two thirds of people around the globe recognise the seriousness of the climate emergency. Uh, and I don't think we would have seen those sorts of figures 10 years ago. So um, I think that's that's something that is helpful for us uh, in this important piece of work. And, and we need to make sure that we we, we meet that challenge. And we continue to learn more about the challenges we face and the urgency with which we must respond every day. So we've all noticed the climate agenda climbing higher and higher in our organisational priorities to the point for many. To, uh, so, so that now it's almost just business as usual. It's part of the general work in which we just expect to have to deliver on um, in the same way that we would expect to be delivering on our financial standards um, for, for any organisation. But it does continue to pose a very real threat. And we have gathered today, not because we need convincing of the need to take action, but because we know that acting together is going to be crucial if we're going to face down such a vast challenge. So we must look further than we have before, beyond our own walls, to the opportunities that collaboration can bring. Individual action by individuals and by individual organisations can only take us so far. But if we are going to take on this vast challenge, we must look further than we have before. Um, and we must take, uh, take up the opportunity to raise each other up uh, so that we can we can so that we can succeed and meet the aims that we we are signing up to today. Tackling the climate emergency may be the greatest challenge of our age, and through our collective effort, it can also be our greatest success. And it is with that hope that I'm pleased to join with you today in launching the Zero Carbon Oxford Partnership. Thank you so much for coming along today. I look forward to seeing you all at a future partnership meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you. Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very Thank you. much.